first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ewan Wider and Finn Tarp for the opportunity to, to participate uh, here. Uh, I'm going to talk about an issue that um, isn't directly, again, I'm not going to directly talk about issues of inequality and gender, but it is, in fact, an issue, I think, that certainly has inequality uh, and gender dimension, uh, dimensions through it. I'm also, I guess I should kind of truth and advertise, I'm going to talk about some work that is very much kind of in progress. And so the, some of the observations that I'm going to be making here, again, are going to be more kind of tentative. But at least from my perspective, there's an enormous amount that we can learn from the experience, again, in China, some of the issues and some of the problems, again, that China happens to be facing, again, even today uh, with respect to land tenure as growth accelerates. Uh, these, are, again, are very important issues. Now, just in terms of kind of background, why do we care, again, about issues of land? You know, for this group, I don't need to say certainly an awful lot about why we care uh, about land, but for any kind of developing low-income country, land is going to be important for all kinds of reasons. And that certainly if we were to take a look at land from the perspective uh, of the household, land is going to be an extremely important source of subsistence. It's going to be a source of income that it doesn't matter whether we happen to be talking about you know, informal credit markets, formal credit markets, land is going to be uh, extremely important uh, as a source of collateral. Land is also going to be an extremely important form, again, in which households hold their wealth. And that insofar as that land happens to be a form in which households happen to hold their wealth, it's going to be important, again, to the ability of households to smooth, again, incomes, again, in the face of various kinds of shocks, again, that may occur. It's also going to be extremely important, again, from an intergenerational perspective, uh, insofar as it's a mechanism through which bequests then uh, are extended. And so what this tells us then is that, that property rights or systems of property rights that are going to be governing land uh, are going to be extremely important. They're going to matter for the efficiency, again, with, land, with which land happens to be used uh, in agriculture. The nature of property rights that households happen to enjoy in the countryside are going to be extremely important uh, for the nature of the incentives that households are going to have to uh, invest in land. But it's also going to be the case that the nature of property rights in agriculture are going to be unbelievably important to the process of structural transformation. So if we thought about the process that any low-income country goes through as it transitions from a primarily agrarian country to where manufacturing and services ultimately become more important, this is a process in which people are moving out of agriculture. And so the ability or the speed with which people are able to move out of agriculture is going to depend a great deal on the productivity of agriculture. And so that insofar as that productivity in agriculture rises, it's going to facilitate this process of structural transformation. But it's also going to be extremely important because the nature of property rights are going to have an influence in the way that as people begin to move off the land, it's going to matter for how land is going to be organized subsequently. And so it's going to be extremely important, again, for those individuals who aren't moving off the land, for those individuals who aren't moving out of the countryside and into the cities. So from both a more macro growth perspective, but also from the perspective of those individuals who kind of remain in the countryside, land, again, and property rights are going to be uh, extremely important. And then it's just obvious that land is also going to have huge distributive implications. That insofar as that land happens to be an asset that generates income, that insofar as it's going to be a source of uh, opportunities for a household to absorb their labor, it's going to matter directly for income distribution. But the nature of the property rights are also going to matter in terms of who is going to be able to benefit from the rising values of land with the course of development. This is an issue here that we see in Vietnam, again, that they're facing with. It's an issue that we see in China. One of the consequences of successful development is that land becomes really valuable, that in countries, again, where land happens to be constrained, where land happens to be a constraint, that this process of urbanization is inevitably going to require taking some of that land that's in agriculture, moving it into non-agricultural uses, land values are going to rise. And so the question then is that who's going to be able to capture, again, those gains, again, that are going to be associated uh, with those rising values? And so that, at least from my own perspective, that when I take a look at issues, again, of property rights, the way in which I like to look at property rights is to see property rights as being a bundle. It's just not a single right, again, that an individual or a household or a group that may enjoy, but rather, in fact, it's going to be a bundle of rights. It's going to be a bundle that's going to include, again, the freedom for households or individuals to decide how to use the land. It's going to be a right that's going to determine uh, their ability or the right of a household to drive income from the land. You can either use, use it yourself. You might be able to rent it to somebody else. It's also going to possibly include the right to alienate land. It's going to include land as a form of collateral. 
So the point that I want to make here is that land, again, if we thought about property rights, again, that we, it's, I think it's best, again, to conceptually to look at land or the property rights, again, as being a bundle, and that households, in fact, are enjoying a, a, a bundle, in some cases more, some cases, uh, in fact, less. That in terms of background, in terms of the issues of land uh, in China, one of the things that it's extremely important to remember that land, again, in own, at least in China, at least land in the countryside, land is not privately owned. Land, in fact, resides, again, with uh, the village or with the collective. So usually the village, in some cases, again, with kind of a, a, a sub-village group called the, called the small group. But these ownership rights reside with the village. Now, beginning in the late 1970s and early 1980s, that these rights, again, in land, the usufruct rights, uh, were devolved, again, down to the households with the beginning uh, of the household responsibility system. Uh, we know from the work of Justin Lin and others that they played an extremely important role uh, in terms of the growth process, that the way in which these land rights, again, were distributed at the village level in a relatively egalitarian way, it helped to ensure that a lot of the benefits were more broadly distributed. And so that in the early 1980s, that the rights that households were uh, originally given were, in some sense, kind of on paper, extended for a period of 15 years. And so by the late 1990s, in which is with what is commonly referred to as the second round of land contracting, these rights that households were in principle to enjoy for 15 years, that these rights were extended for an additional 30 years. And that other rights, again, that are associated to that kind of bundle of property rights that I had talked about a moment ago, these rights, again, were effectively codified as well. But what's important is that the ownership rights continued, again, throughout all of this process to continue to reside, again, with the village. Now, land and land issues and property rights is, is an issue that I've, I've looked at in the past, in the mid-1990s, late 1990s, and did a fair amount of survey work, again, in China as we were trying to look at some of these issues. It's an issue that I kind of moved away to, but it's an issue, again, in the last two or three years that we've begun to kind of move back. And so late in 2011, with a number of collaborators, uh, Zhang Lin Xiao, uh, who's at the Chinese Center for Agricultural Policy, and Susan Whiting, who's at the uh, University of Washington, we did a pilot survey, uh, both at the household level as well as at the village level, uh, in two provinces, uh, Jiangsu and Shanxi, and that we used, again, some of the things that we learned from the pilot, and in particular, how to design a survey to kind of get at these issues, is that we used, again, what we learned from that pilot to try to redesign, revise uh, our survey, and in March of this year, then, we rolled out kind of a revised version uh, of that survey throughout uh, five provinces. Now, the key observation that kind of comes out of that pilot, and in some sense it came out of earlier work that we had done, is that when we take a look at China, and we take a look at rural China, and we take a look at systems of property rights, or the nature of property rights, the things that come through is that there is an enormous amount of heterogeneity in property rights. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about differences, again, at any kind of given moment of time, kind of in the cross-section, or whether within a locality, if we happen to be taking a look about how property rights have been evolving over time, we see, again, considerable differences. And so one of the critical, again, observations then is that there's just an awful lot of heterogeneity. Now, for me to kind of be able to talk about property rights and about how they've evolved and some of the things that we've learned here, I need to just, I need a few definitions. So just some terminology that you may not be familiar with, or at least just kind of terminology that's kind of unique to China, and so you'll kind of know what I'm talking about. So when we talk about the notion of a land taking, this is just an expropriation. This is going to be an expropriation of land uh, use rights by the state or by the village. So it's an expropriation of land use rights. It could be by the state. It could be by the village. And thus, it's going to result in the loss of the endowments, again, of land that households happen to enjoy. I'm also going to talk about reallocations. Now, a reallocation is a non-market redistribution of use rights among villagers. Now, when households were originally, again, extended the use rights, again, to the land, that in principle they were supposed to receive those use rights for a period of 15 years. But what we saw, again, through the first 15 years, first 20 years of reform, that it was very common, again, for a variety of reasons, for what a village would do is that they would take back those use rights from these households and they would redistribute these use rights, again, amongst households, amongst existing households, as well as possibly amongst new households, again, that had formed over the uh, interim. So a reallocation then, it's not a market reallocation, but rather it's a non-market redistribution that is effectively being carried out by the village. I'm also going to talk about village intermediated transfers. This is also in some sense going to be a non-market form of allocation, 
But it's going to be a non-market form of reallocation of use rights that we see that's become very common today in which the village, village cadres, village effect, officials, are effectively playing the role as an intermediary, an intermediary between households who happen to have these use rights and other third parties, again, who might want to use the land. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about rental, which is just kind of the direct voluntary exchange, again, of these use rights uh, between households. When we take a look at China uh, over the course of the last 20 years or across villages, that what we're going to see is that we're going to see an awful lot of heterogeneity, and it's going to be heterogeneity, again, that cuts uh, in multiple dimensions. First of all, that as we look across, again, China and the regions of China, that what we're going to see is that the amount of land that households have lost, again, through either formal or informal land takings differs considerably. And so that if you take a look again at some of the coastal provinces, that you'll see that the amount, of house, the amount of land that households has lost, again, has been considerable. As you kind of move in the inland, it's often much less. But the first point that I want to make is that there's big differences, again, across these villages in terms of how much in the way of land and use rights to land that households have lost. What we're also going to see is that the institutional mechanisms that are governing Again, kind of the exchange of these use rights also differ, that they differ in the cross-section, they differ over time, and that we're going to see differences in the role of reallocation and village-mediated transfers. In other words, that we're going to see, again, in some localities, these kind of non-market mechanisms through which land rights are being kind of allocated or reallocated amongst users. In some localities, we're going to find those to be very common, that they're going to be predominant, they'll be the predominant mechanism. In other localities, we're going to see rentals, so that there's going to be Again, institution differences, again, in these institutional mechanisms. Now, there's a fair amount of work, again, that's been done over time on looking, again, at some of these issues. But much of it, that when it's looked at such things as land takings, the role of reallocations, transfers, and rentals, is that it's largely looked at these things in isolation from each other, rather than, again, trying to begin to try to provide an explanation that can explain, again, why we see at various points in time, again, the alternative role, again, of these, of these mechanisms. In terms of the motivating questions, again, that are kind of directing this work that, that we've been doing, is that I think to some extent one of the most important is that insofar as that we observe heterogeneity, insofar as that we observe differences, and that I would argue that it doesn't matter any issue that I've ever looked at, again, in the context of China, that what I see is that I always see heterogeneity, that there's an enormous amount of, of differences, again, that we observe, again, uh, across localities. What is it that's determining, again, these differences that we happen to Observe. So that's going to be kind of a fundamental question about what's explaining these differences over time, what's explaining these differences that we observe over the localities. But equally important is that once we've kind of recognized that there are these differences, again, in terms of the nature of the property rights that households happen to enjoy, we're going to be interested in what are the implications, again, of these alternative arrangements? What are going to be their implications for the efficiency with which the land is going to be used in agriculture? What implications are they going to have for productivity in agriculture? And equally important, what implications are they going to have for uh, distribution? Third, we're going to be interested in, well, insofar as that we're observing rising land values, insofar as that we see land that's kind of being taken out of cultivation and moved into non-agricultural use to, to accommodate the enormous growth that we happen to be seeing, again, in the cities uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, who's capturing these gains, again, from these rising land values? Fourth, that you know, one of the issues that we're all very much aware of is that certainly in the context of, of, of China, local protests relating to land, land seizures, again, have become an extremely, again, important you know, and at times a relatively sensitive issue. And so the question that we want to ask and that we're concerned about is that, well, what is the link, again, between the nature of the property rights that households enjoy, the governance structures, again, that in some sense that relate to land, and these local disputes and protests? And then finally, from a policy perspective, is that what is it that needs to be done in order to try to ensure, again, outcomes uh, that are, in fact, more socially desirable? So those are kind of the, the motiv motivating questions. In terms of kind of on the basis of the work that we've done uh, up to this point, if I could try to just kind of put, again, at its simplest, make a number of observations, again, about the argument at its simplest. One of the things, again, that's true, again, in rural China, and this is going to be true in a lot of settings that we happen to be looking at, is that this bundle of property rights and land is going to be valuable to multiple actors. It's just not going to be valuable to those farmers and those households that we've talked about. It's also going to be equally important to village cadres and village administrators. 
It's going to be important because at least at that level, land becomes an important source of fiscal revenue, or at least it had been an important source of, of fiscal revenue that could use to finance, again, certain kinds of fiscal expenditures. It's also going to be an important source, again, of economic rents, that as we begin to kind of move up at higher levels of government, land is also going to be an extremely important source of fiscal revenue. And so one of the interesting things, again, about the Chinese system and about the nature of the rights that households enjoy is that by law, if I'm a farmer, if I lose my use rights, I'm only allowed to be compensated on the basis of the agricultural value of the land. So only the agricultural value. And so today, again, that what that means then is that if you happen to be, let's just say, in these provinces in which we were doing, again, this survey work, that the compensation today, at least on an acre basis in these localities, that in dollar terms, it's an enormous amount. That the compensation, again, per acre is about $50,000 US per acre. Now, that's an awful lot of money. You have to realize that the amount of land per capita in lots of these villages is only about a sixth of that. But the more important thing is, is that this land, again, that farmers, again, may be compensated for by 50,000, that that land is going to be resold to developers for an amount that could be 15 times that, 20 times that. And so, in fact, again, it's that spread between what farmers are compensated and in what developers are paying for that land. And so that difference, a good portion of which, again, represents fiscal revenue, some of which goes, again, gets dissipated in the form of, of, of rent, um, uh, in, in the form of rents, that becomes, again, an extremely, again, important dimension. And so that what we would argue, at least what I would argue, is that when we go ahead and that when we take a look at the system of property rights that we observe at any given time or at any place, that what I would argue is that what we're effectively seeing is a contest. It's a contest, again, amongst these competing claims, claims, again, by households, claims by local government officials, claims by higher levels of government officials, that's really cutting across multiple domains. Those domains, again, include the economic, they include the legal, they include the social, and political. And here, again, I'm borrowing, in some sense, from some of you know, Aoki's work, again, kind of on, on endogenous, again, institutional change that recognizes as such, this as such. And then, moreover, that what we see, again, in the context of rural China is that actors, in this case, even some cases, households, are going to be pursuing these claims, again, with respect to the property rights and land. Uh, they're going to be pursuing these things, again, through uh, multiple domains. But what becomes important that amongst all of these interactions that we see between the economic, the social, the legal, and the political, that what seems to be happening, again, most often is that the political rules are the ones that are seem to be usually prevailing, and that we find, again, most often that local officials are opting for those mechanisms that are simply grounded, again, in the exercise of their political authority. So that in rural China, despite the fact, again, that these, the political dimensions, again, of the processes are extremely important, land still gets directed to higher value uses. So in that sense, it's going to be growth enhancing. But it's often the case that this is going to come at extremely high cost, and that they're ultimately implying that a deeper set of reforms, again, may be required uh, for a more socially desired set uh, of outcomes. And so here, again, in some sense, it's just kind of re reflective. This is the case of Wugan. There should be no G at the end. But a case that was in the, the news, again, a few years ago. And there's lots of cases. There are lots of other cases. I've certainly been in villages myself where I've seen exactly these kinds of things that are going on. Just you know, cases, again, of just popular protests uh, against, against land seizures. Uh, and so protests against uh, local officials and administrators. Now, in the basis of the pilot survey that we've gone ahead and done is that what we see is an enormous amount of heterogeneity. We see differences, again, across time. We see differences, again, across provinces. So here, again, are just two provinces that were part of our pi pilot survey, Jiangsu, which is a coastal province. That's that province, again, that just kind of encompasses, again, Shanghai, Shanxi, again, which is a province in the northwest. But what you can see here is that there's differences, again, certainly between the two provinces. And so I'm generalizing a bit. But there's certainly differences, again, between these provinces, uh, as well as differences over time in terms of the mechanisms, again, that we see, again, that are being used through which these uh, property rights and land are being exchanged. We see the exact same thing, then, uh, at the uh, household level uh, as well. But what, moreover, that when we go ahead and then when we take a look for a link, again, between these changes that we're observing and disputes. And so one of the things, again, that we've done as part of our survey work is not only to try to enumerate at the household level, but also at the village level all of the changes that have occurred over a period of about 15 or 20 years is that what we also do is that we look for, collect information on the nature of the disputes. 
the disputes at the village level, household involvement in these disputes. And clearly, that one of the things that you can see here is that there are lots of disputes again and lots of protests that are going to be related again to, again, how these uh, property rights again are being reallocated. And these disputes are certainly much more prominent again in Jiangsu than what we see again in Shanxi, and that they typically again to be much more associated with the transfers as well as in the takings. But what we also see then is that the mechanisms again through which households are trying to resolve their disputes, that they're going to differ, that there's a variety of mechanisms through which households are going to try to press, the, press their claim, that they're often going to try to utilize or take advantage of multiple mechanisms. But perhaps the most interesting thing is, and this is in some sense just in contrast to the work that Susan again has done in other provinces, is that we don't see the local courts being used, that households again aren't pressing these claims through the local courts. So just in terms of some kind of larger uh, kind of policy implications, is that what I would argue is that we really, what's critical again to trying to formulate policy in this context, is that we really need to understand again what underlies the differences that we observe, and I'm not sure that we, we know that. That this is again going to be extremely critical to try to explain again the dominance of the, of the political over the economic, over the, uh, over the, over the, uh, over the, le over the uh, legal. Um, as well, it's going to be extremely important again to know who the winners and losers are uh, in the process and what the larger again implications may be. As a final point, I guess the point I guess that I would want to make, and this kind of relates to some observations that were made from the first day, that when you take a look again at the Chinese land law, that this is a good land law. So the problem in some sense here is not so much in terms of the law, in terms of what the law says, but in fact it's a problem again in terms of its implementation, which means again it's going to have much to do again with the nature of the incentives again with local governments, the nature of those incentives and how they happen to be aligned again with the top. And so the, in some sense perhaps a key question is, is that is there perhaps a kind of a fundamental incompatibility between policy and the incentives of local actors in the context of China's larger political economy? And so that insofar as that land, at least at one level, represents an important source of fiscal revenue, that's extremely important from the point of view of the center. You have a fiscal system that doesn't do well in terms of uh, its uh, intergovernmental finance. Then in that case, then central level government may often be willing to kind of turn its head again to some of these things because of how important land is again in this case. So just final point then, it just raises again these other issues about what other kinds of reforms again are going to be needed and in some sense are these going to be politically feasible. Thank you very much, Lauren. Sorry to, <laughs> sorry to cut you short.